Praise the Lord Jesus. Say, Father, thank you for another blessed opportunity to hear and receive the word of God. My heart is open. My mind is alert. My antenna is raised to hear God's word and to act on it. In Jesus' name. Amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You may be seated. Oh, glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God. Say thank you, Lord Jesus. Do you love Jesus? Okay. Now, what we're going to share, beginning from tonight, is so important. I would like you to make sure that you are listening, in that whatever portion of the Bible that we refer to, you are quick to look at it and also to write it down. In Christianity today, there's a lot of emphasis on getting something from God. There's a lot of emphasis on having God do something for us. We are really all the time wanting God to do something. A lot of times we find ourselves asking God for something all the time. Our prayer life is full of requests. In fact, today when people talk about prayer, they associate it with requests, prayer requests. They got something they want God to do about their business. They got something they want God to do about their physical body. They, they, have, they have a need in their family for their marriage, for their finances, you know. And uh, you, if, you are, if you are acquainted with God's Word in a deeper level, you just wonder, is this the way to serve God? Do we only relate with God because we want Him to do something for us? Who are we? What does God want us to be? In the mind of God, who are we? And we continually pray and ask and ask and ask. And sometimes we even wonder whether or not we are heard. Many times it's because we have made a God out of our needs. We worship our needs. We're continually praying about our needs and thereby talking about our needs and concerned about our needs to the point that our needs have gained so much attention in our lives. We don't really know which one is God. Is it our needs? Is it the God to whom we speak? Or ourselves who are in need. I want to read something to you from the Bible that will give you an idea of what the Christian life really ought to be. I'd like to, you know, I often tell you every major truth begins from Genesis. Huh? Every final truth ends in Revelation. Come on, talk to me. I said every major truth begins its teaching from Genesis. But every final truth ends in Revelation. In other words, when you go to the book of Revelation, you'd find it there. Then you know this is the final truth. Praise God. Hallelujah. It's like God revealing himself to Moses. And he said to Moses, 
He said, Moses, in Exodus chapter number 6, when you read verses 2 and 3, he said, Moses, I want to introduce myself to you. He said, I am Jehovah. He said, my name is Jehovah. But your fathers knew me as El Shaddai. Many of us pronounce it El Shaddai. Pronunciation signs say El Shaddai. That's more difficult to pronounce, right? Okay, but he said, that's my name, Jehovah. But Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob knew me as El Shaddai. And, but I am Jehovah. Now, look at the truth. Here was a truth that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob had. But there was another truth. A newer revelation. And that's in Jehovah, the covenant God. But it didn't end there. The final truth, when you come to the book of Revelation, his name is Jesus. The name is not El Shaddai, it's not Jehovah. He said, Thou hast exalted thy word. Above all thy name. And who is his word? Jesus. So the final truth you find in the book of Revelation. All right. Now, having that in mind, so I want to read to you in our message today from the book of Revelation. I want us to see what God expects us to be like. What is the mind of God concerning us? What does he really think about us? Who am I to God when he looks at me? What's on his mind? What's on his mind? What's on God's mind? I like to know what God thinks about me. Hallelujah. I don't care what people think, but I, I like to know what God thinks. There are a lot of people who always run around trying to find out what people think about them. That's wrong. You don't have to leave to their expectation. You leave to God's expectation. Hallelujah. Okay, so, the book of Revelation, chapter number one. Ho, 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 hallelujah. <laughs> Thank you, Lord Jesus. Woo-hoo, glory. Ooh. I'm going to read to you from verse 4. Hello. Are, are, you, are, you, are, you, are you ready? Yes. Are you set? Yes. Okay. So let's go. From verse number 4. The book of Revelation chapter 1. Revelation chapter number 1, I'm reading from verse 4. John, to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace be unto you, and peace from him which is, and which was, and which is to come. And from the seven spirits which are before his throne, now, we have a teaching on seven spirits of God. If, you've not, if, if you don't have the tapes, make sure you ask for them. So you can understand what the Bible means by the seven spirits of God. Verse 5. And from Jesus Christ, he's giving greetings. He says, grace be unto you. And peace. And from Jesus Christ, verse 5. Who is, watch what he calls Jesus. Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead. Now, that's very significant. You know, in the book of John, St. John's Gospel, Jesus Christ was called the only begotten of the Father. All right? He was called the only begotten of the Father. After his resurrection, 
he was never again called the only begotten of the Father. Why? Because when he died, we died with him. When he was buried, we were buried together with him. When God raised him from the dead, we were raised together with him. And so we came up together with him, new creations, with a new kind of life. Hallelujah. And we became sons and daughters of God, just like Jesus. Hallelujah. So now he's called the first begotten of the dead. Not the first begotten of the Father, or the only begotten of the Father, but the first begotten of the dead. Why? He's not talking about physical death. He's talking about spiritual death. Because he was not the first person to be raised from the dead. In the Old Testament, the prophets raised others from the dead. In the New Testament, Jesus raised some from the dead. The apostles did too. So Jesus was not the first to be raised from the dead. But he was the first to come out of spiritual death. You know what spiritual death is? Spiritual death is separation from God. When a man is dead in sin, he's spiritually dead. And then the worst of all is when a man dies physically and goes to hell. Jesus went to hell for us. When he died, he died for us. And then he went to hell in our place. We were supposed to go to hell, but Jesus went to hell in our place. So we don't have to go to hell. So anybody who believes in Jesus will never go to hell. Because Jesus went to hell for us. Only those who don't believe in Jesus will have to go to hell for themselves. If you believe in Jesus, you'll never go to hell. Because you already went in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. You went there in Him, in Christ. Glory to God. All right, now follow this. It's very powerful. It's coming. And from Jesus, Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, and the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us, and washed us from our sins in his own blood. Thank you, Lord Jesus. He washed us from our sins. He didn't say he is washing us. He didn't say he's trying to wash us. He didn't say he shall wash us from our sins. He says the one who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. When did he do it? Talk to me. When were you washed from your sins? You're not sure. The Bible says, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. When did he wash us? Oh, I feel like singing. Whew. Unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins. In his own blood. So when did he wash us from our sins? Why are you all so quiet? You're not sure? You're not sure where he washed us or when he washed us from our sins? In his own blood. Whew. I want to ask you again because the way you're looking at me now, I'm wondering whether you really know. When were we washed from our sins? Huh? Thank you, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for everything you have done. 
Hallelujah. When were we washed from our sins? When he died on the cross. Hallelujah. Okay. I'll leave that for tomorrow. Now I can see that most of you are just not sure. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Okay, listen to this as we read. I hope I don't say it while we're going on. Just, <laughs> all right. He says, and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. He already did it. And can you see verse, verse 6? Can you see verse 6? I'm talking about what does God expect of us? What does he think about us? What's on his mind when he looks at us? What does God think about you? And hat. I want all the sisters to read verse 6. Only the sisters. All the ladies, read verse 6. Want to go. Alright, brothers, can you read verse 6? Want to go. Hallelujah. He says, Unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood, and hath made us kings. And hath made us kings. He is not planning on doing it. And hath made us kings. Hath made us kings. He didn't say when we get to heaven, he shall make us kings. This is not a promise. It's a statement of fact. A present tense reality. The call facts for now. He hath already done it. He has made us kings. He's already done it. So when God looks at us, what does he see? Hold on, hold on. I want to tell you why many are not living as kings. Firstly, because of ignorance. They do not even know what it's all about. You see, it's a spiritual kingdom. And the physical world belongs to the spiritual world. The spirit world rules the physical world. You have to understand that. Life is spiritual. That's why success has nothing to do with your education. Success has nothing to do with your family name. Success has nothing to do with what nation you come from. Success is spiritual. It's based on spiritual laws. I'll come to that. But I want you to understand this. The Bible says, He hath made us kings. He hath made us kings. But the Bible also says in Galatians chapter number 4, when you read from verse 1, that the heir, as long as he is a child, is not different from a servant, though he be lord of all. As long as he is a child, he will lead the life of a servant. Even though everything belongs to him. 
He didn't say when he is a child. He says as long as he is a child. Doesn't matter how long he chooses to remain a child. If he wants to remain a child all his life, he will live the life of a servant. Maybe I, maybe I said that too fast. It's in your book, Galatians chapter 4. I want you to see it. Book of Galatians chapter number 4. Are you there? So, I want you to read from verse 1. Everybody, want to go. You see that? Though he be Lord of all, he is not different from a servant. He is the heir, all right? But as long as he is a child. He says, as long as he's a child, he will have to live the life of a servant. In, in Revelation chapter 1, where we read, in verse 6, he said, and hath made us kings. He's already done it. He hath made us. He's not going to do it. He's already done it. He hath made us kings. So we are kings. But you see, we have to grow. We have to come to our office. We have to come to our position. And many of us are not ready for the life of a king. Because we've not been trained in the things of God. You've got to be trained. And part of your training in the life of a king is that kings don't beg. Kings don't beg. Our prayers are full of begging. We're begging everybody. We beg at work. We beg at home. We're begging away. We beg everywhere. Oh, please, 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 please. Always we're begging. Then we beg God. We beg Him for everything. We ask Him, please, I'm begging you. Kings don't beg. He had made us kings. Kings don't beg. Come on. Hello. Are, are, you, are you hearing this? You sure? Say it with me. Kings don't beg. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. It's not enough to just say it. You have to develop that mentality. It has to become your way of reasoning. Your way of thinking. Kings don't beg. Now, what does that say? It suggests something about the kind of prayer life that we ought to have. We don't beg for our health. We don't beg to be set free. We don't beg for deliverance. We don't beg for anything. We don't even beg for God's help. Now, who made us kings? Was it at our request? Did we ask God to do it? Did we ask him to do it? No, we didn't. It, it wasn't our idea. We didn't have a clue about God's plans. It was his choice. It was his idea. He chose to make us kings. So, I said, one of those vital things that a king should know is that kings don't beg. They don't beg. They don't beg. Tell somebody your days of begging are over. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> See, you have to understand this. This is a spiritual kingdom. And it is greater than the physical world. It rules the physical world. It rules. For example, if you want a job, if you get the job in the realm of the spirit, nothing can stop it in the physical world. 
But you see, many don't know how to get things done in the realm of the Spirit. We belong to a spiritual kingdom. We're being trained in the life of the Spirit. The Word of God tells us to walk in the Spirit. And if we walk in the Spirit, we will live in victory. Constant victory. It doesn't mean that there will be no crisis. It doesn't mean that there will be no trouble. But when they come, there will be bread. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> See, the life that has been given to us is a supernatural life of victory. Every day. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. <laughs> if, you, if you wanted healing... If you can receive your healing in the spirit, nothing will so stop its physical manifestation. If you wanted a child, if you receive that child in the realm of the spirit, nothing will stop the child from coming in. Don't you understand? Many of us are not operating in the spirit. Some don't even know it exists. Some say, just leave me down here. I've not even finished the operation here. You want me to operate in the spirit? No, a thousand times no. You ought to be operating in the spirit first. The spirit world rules the physical world. Hallelujah. Do you understand that? Let it soak. Tell somebody, let it soak. Say this with me. I'm a child of God. I'm born again. Now, you know what it is to be born again? It means to be born from the realm of the Spirit. You're born of God. You're born of His Word, which means you're exactly like Him. Yeah. Hallelujah. Oh, I say it all the time. The life of God is in me. The life of God is in me. From the crown of my head to the soles of my feet to the tips of my toes. The life of God is in me. I refuse to be sick. The life of God is in me. Oh, glory to God. I've got the life of God in me. That life is in my bones. It's in my skin. It's in my muscles. It's in my nerves. Do you understand what I'm talking about? The life of God is in me. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I may have some pains in my body, but I'll still say the life of God is in me. I'm born with the nature of God. I refuse to be sick. And I refuse to accommodate trouble in my body. Hallelujah. I've got the life of God in me. I say it again and again and again. I don't know how many times a day. I just tell myself the life of God is in me. Oh, I've got the life of God in me. Thank you, Lord Jesus. The life of God is in me. I got Zoe in me. Ooh, glory to God. I've got Zoe in me. It's in my spirit. It's in my soul. It's in my body. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I got the life of God in me. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. Maybe I injured myself and it hurts. Oh, I got the life of God in me. I got the life of God in me. Ooh, thank you, Jesus. That's what I do. I got it in me. That means there has to be a restoration. But do you know that there are people who had a simple injury and it's been five years now? And that wound wouldn't be healed? Because they don't know about this life of God. 
But I got the life of God in me. <laughs> Hallelujah. Somebody said, his heart is not beating right. You, you feel it and it's like, oh, it's not beating right. Dear Lord Jesus, I've got the life of God in me. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Woo, glory. You, you know what? A lot of us have a problem. You know what that problem is? We know too much. We don't know anything about God. We just know too much of science. We know too much of biology. We know too much of the medical world until we don't know nothing about God. Let me explain to you what I mean. Somebody says, Oh, my heart. I think, I think my heart is not beating right. Which one? Because when the Bible talks about the heart... <laughs> It basically talks about the human spirit. But you are thinking about that substance, that mass in here that goes boom, boom, boom. You understand what I mean? You know too much, brother. Who told you you got something in there? <laughs> Listen, if you will just leave it alone, and be normal. Nobody will put you on the operating table. Nobody will always listen. Maybe it's my heart. Hey. Maybe. Maybe. High blood pressure. Who told you? Have you seen your heart before? I, I, I think that God didn't want us to see it. That's why he sealed it up. What do you think? If God wanted us to be looking at our hearts, our bodies should have been transparent. So every time you just look at your heart, say, is it working? <laughs> we are too concerned. Every little thing, we want to find out what's inside. You want to find out what's inside. That's the trouble. Why don't you think of what God has put inside? He says he has put the life of God inside you. It doesn't matter how that heart is beating. If you turn out right. Can you shout amen somebody? Hallelujah. They say my blood pressure is rising. Okay, okay. Which one is the correct one? And they said, they said, they, who said? The prophet Isaiah said, who had believed our report? <laughs> Hallelujah. It doesn't matter who said it, brother. If it's your body, you say everything is all right. Let the life of God gain the ascendancy. Hallelujah. Oh boy. Say it again. I got a life of God in me. Look at your hands. Say, I got a life of God in me. Look at yourself. I got a life of God in me. Woo! Glory to God. Hallelujah. I got the life of God in me. Woo! Glory to God. Sit down. Hallelujah. Thank you. Sit down for a moment. Hallelujah. Glory to God. The life of God is in me. He hath made us kings. He hath made, oh boy. He hath, he hath made us kings. I know who I am. He hath made us kings. Hallelujah. He hath made us kings. 
He's already done it. I refuse to beg. He had made us kings. So what does that mean? So what's on God's mind? When he says that he has made us kings, what does that mean? Can I tell you what it means? Oh, hallelujah. Well, let's look at the life of the first man so we can understand it. Genesis. The book of Genesis, chapter number one. And I'm, I'm going to be reading to you from verse 26. And God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. And God blessed them. And God said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it. Subdue. He said, subdue it. You know what it is to subdue something? Look, this thing is here now. You can't subdue it. You know why? It's down. It's not responding. You get it? You subdue something that had its own mind. If it had its own mind, if it had its own will, that was different from yours, then you exercise control to make its will subject to yours. That's what it is to subdue something. You tame it. That's what God said. He said, subdue. Subdue. Use the word, everybody. Say, subdue. subdue. One more time. Subdue. subdue. I want to read that verse 28 one more time. He says, and God bless them. And God said unto them, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. And subdue it. Subdue the earth. Subdue the earth. And have dominion. Over the fish of the sea. And over the fowl of the earth. And over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. In other words, anything, anything that lives. Anything that moves. Glory to God. Where? In the earth. What does that suggest? He made that first man a king. He made that first man a king. Oh boy. Oh boy. Think about God. What do you think about God? Have you ever thought about heaven? From what you've read in your Bible, does heaven look like an ugly place? The streets are made of pure gold, the Bible says. So God must be a God of prosperity. He loves good things. Listen, now, he made streets and when he wanted to pave his own streets, he used pure gold. No, listen, listen, listen. That's to show you what kind of a God he is. If you wanted to tie roads for God, for, listen, 
a God who would use pure gold to pave his own streets. What do you think he would expect you to use for him? You think he'll, he'll, he'll take he'll take what you got out there? No, it's to show you the kind of God he is. When he made the first man that looked like him, he made him a king. He couldn't take anything less to look like him. It had to be a king. You know, we, we read a lot of stuff into the mind of God because we don't study the Bible. When you study the Bible, you understand who he really is. No. Have you ever, have you ever thought about heaven? No, you, you, you think God loves it. When we look like we don't know what we're doing, when we look confused, unhappy, I told you, oh, you you are from you came from the satellite church. But most of you that are uh, cell leaders, if you were at the CRC, you recall what I said. I said when you come to church, dress well. Are you hearing me? Learn to dress well. Stop keeping your best clothes in that box. Hello, hold on, hold on. I know, you know, some of you have nice clothes. You will not wear them until once a year, Christmas. And nowadays we are so busy, we can't even dress right at Christmas time. Years ago, everybody used to visit at Christmas time, but now nobody goes out. Y'all sit down at home. You don't know what to do with your Christmas wares. Go and pull them out. And start wearing them. That bag you bought for special occasion. It's two years now. You haven't had any special occasion. <laughs> God is still waiting for you to use it. Because we don't know what a special occasion is. That's our problem. We think that the special occasion is when the, the governor of central bank visits us. We're looking for some top-class society visitors. You are wrong. God doesn't call them special visitors. The special occasion is when we come into the house of God like this, brother. When you come into church, dress fine. I said, go and bring all those clothes you kept with camphor somewhere. Go and bring them out. And then those of you who have special plates for special occasion, and you have not used those plates now. You've not used them since your marriage. Special plates for special visitors who have never come. The trouble is they came. You did not recognize them. Are you hearing me? When that brother... And that sister, when they came to visit you, you didn't recognize them. You thought they were ordinary because they dressed ordinarily. So you were keeping your special plates for the kings of this world. Brother, your brothers and sisters in Christ are your special visitors. As they come to visit you, go into your bedroom. Pull out those wonderful plates. Are you hearing me? Yeah. Go to your cupboard. Bring out the best spoons, the best knives, the best glasses. Set the food on the table. They are your special visitors. When you start operating like that, that is spiritual wisdom. When you start operating like that, the angels will show up in your house. Are you hearing what I'm telling you now? Glory to God. Think like God. 
Think like God. Think like God. Some of you men, you know, in your house you have about three sitting rooms. Sitting room A is for the special, special. <laughs> sitting room B is for special. Sitting room C is for, mm hmm. <laughs> See? Who, who is it? <laughs> Mr. Sons. Who? Uh, put him in, put him in. If he's born again, especially if you hear that is your PCF leader, your cell leader, your PCU leader, your pastor, take him right into A. Hallelujah. You will be blessed. You see, because many of us don't know when Jesus shows up. Jesus comes in his kids. He said, in the last day, I will say to many, I was hungry, you didn't feed me. I was thirsty, you didn't give me to drink. I was sick and you didn't visit me. And they're going to say, Lord, when were you hungry and we didn't feed you? When were you thirsty and we didn't give you to drink? When were you sick and we didn't visit you? And I will say to them, Jesus said, I will say to them, in as much as you didn't do it for these little ones, you didn't do it for me. He said, he that receiveth you, receiveth me. So brother, when they come to you in the name of Jesus, look at Jesus and receive them. Did you hear what I just told you? Then you, you'll be ready for angelic manifestations in your home. Supernatural blessings in your home. Things that you cannot explain will begin to happen. Supernatural manifestations of the Holy Ghost will begin to take place. Why? Because you have learned to welcome God. When God shows up, he doesn't come in a red heart. You understand? When God shows up, he doesn't come with a beaming light. When God shows up, he comes in his kids. Simple, but real. Hallelujah. Are you still there? Thank you, Lord Jesus. Oh, glory to his holy name. He hath made us kings. I'm a king. He hath made us kings. How do kings pray? I want, to, I want to show you how kings pray. Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus, I give you praise. Praise for the rest that you've given me. The life of peace and joy that you've given me. The life of health that you've given me. For making me a success. Thank you for making me a witness of the gospel of Jesus Christ. The life of God is in me. I thank you, Father Lord God. Because as you are, so am I in this world. That's how kings pray. And kings begin to decree a thing. They declare peace at work in the name of Jesus. I go to work today and I decree peace at work. Peace in my office. In the name of Jesus. Peace. They speak peace. And when they say peace, there's peace. I speak peace into my home. Not, they don't say, oh God, give us peace in our home. No! Kings don't pray like that. Are you hearing me? Kings don't pray and ask God, oh God, give us peace in our home. No. Kings say in the name of Jesus, I decree peace. Pakamandelebushata. speak peace in the realm of the spirit I speak peace I calm the storms and as you talk like that 
you will feel your faith rising. You'll feel your faith rising. Does it look like business is changing? And it looks like money is not coming in like before. Oh, oh, relax, brother. You don't have a problem. Relax. In the name of Jesus, prosperity is mine. listen to this and when you say that you say I open my mind for ideas in the name of Jesus I open all the doors in the name of Jesus prosperity is coming in money is coming in I receive I receive I receive I receive in the name of Jesus oh glory to God hallelujah I walk in prosperity. I walk, oh glory, I walk in victory. In the name of Jesus, I'm a success. Money is coming to me now. I receive now. Oh. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Are you there, somebody? He says, And thou shalt decree a thing also, and it shall be established unto thee. Say this with me I'm a king. One more time, I'm a king. One more time, I'm a king. I decree peace. I decree victory. There's only one way in my life. Only one way. It's the way of prosperity. It's the way of victory. It's the way of success. I do not fail. I do not fail. Because victory is already mine. Oh, glory to God. Hallelujah. I know who I am. Ha, 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 ha. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Woo! Ha, ha. Ha, ha, ha. Hey! Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The lines have fallen unto me in pleasant places. I have a goodly heritage. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Ibo Shatala Mandele Bosata Kabaya. Hey, glory to God. Hallelujah. Somebody say hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. Sit down. Congratulate three people. Congratulations! 
Hallelujah. Sit down. Hallelujah. Sit down. Praise the Lord. Sit down. You know what? We're just introducing the subject. Are you hearing me? I said, we are just introducing the subject. So I'll just show you a little bit of where we're going. Then I'll, I'll, we'll pray. And then I'll let you go tonight. All right, go back to that book of Revelation. Hallelujah. You know, Jesus said, when the heathen pray, he said, the thing that they shall be heard for their much speaking. What is it? Do it, Lord. Do it, Lord. Do it, Lord. Do it, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Do it, Lord. Do it, Lord. You can say that a thousand times. That's not going to change the mind of God. It's not how many times you say it. Put your faith to work. Oh God, I'm praying for my son so that his head will be correct. Oh, change it, Lord. <laughs> you know? Say, so change his mind, Lord. Change it, Lord. Change it, Lord. Change it, Lord. Change it, Lord. The only thing that's changing is your position. <laughs> change it, Lord. Change it, Lord. That's not going to change anything. See, you... There are people who are praying. They don't know why. They just keep praying and praying and praying. Do you know how to pray? If you haven't read the book on prayer, go and get it. Praying the right way. The people who say, they say, a lot of times people pray and they say, Lord Jesus, I thank you in Jesus' name. Wrong prayer. Hallelujah. You can say, oh Lord Jesus, I thank, I thank you in Jesus' name. Oh Lord Jesus, in Jesus' name. <laughs> Jesus said for us to pray to the Father in the name of Jesus. We don't pray to Jesus. We pray in the name of Jesus. We can tell Jesus how much we love him. We can, we, we fellowship with him, but we do not pray to Jesus. We pray to the Father in the name of Jesus. That's the way to pray. We can speak to Jesus. We can tell him how we feel. We can tell him what's in our hearts. But when you want to make a request, you make the request of the Father in the name of Jesus. When you know who you are, you'll understand why it is so. Someone said, but we can pray to Jesus. Oh, no! No, a thousand times. Listen, that will stop you from knowing who you are. This thing is not an issue of technicalities. No! We are not trying to split airs. Let me tell you what the real case is. When you understand why you should pray to the Father in the name of Jesus, when you understand why, it will show you who you really are. It means that you are in the...